Hello, and welcome to the channel. As a true crime content creator, I've come across many kinds of cases in my search for the next story to cover. These range from horrific tales that shock and disgust me, stories that inspire others, or unsolved crimes that I want to bring attention to. However, there's one type of case that I've only covered once. If you're familiar with the story of Greg Flenican, you'll know that his was a story that would sound like it came from an episode of Jonathan Creek, something I mentioned in that video. And so today we'll be looking at a similar case, involving murder and a locked room mystery, that would take several years before the shocking truth would be uncovered. But before we get into today's case, if you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell so you never miss an upload. It's free to do, and it helps a small channel like mine greatly. Now with those formalities out of the way, let's begin. Today's story starts on the 22nd of August 1922, where police were called to the Osterreich's Los Angeles home overlooking Sunset Boulevard after receiving calls from concerned neighbours who could hear screaming and gunshots from inside the property. Upon arrival, they could hear a woman's cries for help from inside. Forcing their way in, they searched the home and found 44-year-old Fred Osterreich laid out on the floor. He had been shot to death. Nearby, they could hear the woman's screams coming from a locked closet. After they managed to open the door using keys which they'd found laying on the floor, they found 42-year-old Wahlberger Dolly Osterreich inside. Dolly explained to the officers that both she and her husband were victims of a robbery that went wrong. Fred's diamond watch and money left in their bedroom had been taken, but otherwise nothing else appeared to have been disturbed. Police would immediately suspect that Dolly knew more than what she was telling them. However, it would take almost 10 years for them to learn just how crazy and unexpected the true story was. Born Wahlberger Corshell on the 12th of June 1880, not much is known about her past, except that she was born to German immigrant parents. It's unclear if she was born in Imperial Germany, but she grew up in Milwaukee alongside a community densely made up of German immigrants. Later, she would find work in a textile mill owned by Fred Osterreich. Fred was also a German immigrant who had found success in textile manufacturing and was two years her senior. Dolly was said to be an attractive, charismatic young woman and would unsurprisingly catch Fred's attention. And by the time Dolly was just 17 years old, the pair had wed. Despite now being the wife of her former boss, Dolly would remain positively viewed by her former colleagues, often calmly resolving labour disputes that Fred's impatient and unlikable manner could otherwise handle. Their marriage was pretty much rocky from the outset. Dolly would often yearn for Fred's attention, but he would heavily focus himself into his work, neglecting Dolly in the process. And to add to this, Fred was said to be verbally abusive to Dolly. Even though the pair had troubles, they would have a child together named Raymond in August 1900, although tragically he would pass away just shy of his 10th birthday in July 1910. The death of their son sent the pair on a downward spiral. Fred would immerse himself into his work even more, and he would find solace at the bottom of a bottle. Dolly, meanwhile, effectively mourning alone, would begin to see herself as a motherly figure at the textile mill and seek attention from other men to make up for the lack of affection she was getting at home. Rumours were rife that Dolly had been having extramarital affairs, although this was never truly confirmed. That is until 1913. One day, Dolly wanted to use her sewing machine, only to find that it wasn't working. Dolly asked her husband to have someone come round to repair the machine. Fred agreed and chose to send 17-year-old Otto Sanhuber. Very little is known about Otto, except for the fact that he was orphaned as a young child and that he was employed by Fred as a handyman who would help with odd jobs around Fred's business. When Otto arrived, he was greeted by Dolly, who was only wearing a robe and stockings. She took him upstairs to the bedroom 
where the sewing machine was. Here, Otto would be seduced by Dolly's advances, and the pair entered into an affair. For a while, the pair would meet up at hotels, and Otto would even visit the home while Fred was out on business. However, this was unsustainable, as neighbours would begin to suspect what Dolly and Otto were up to, although Dolly would explain to them that the man who she would often be seen with was just his, quote, vagabond half-brother. Not wanting their steamy affair to stop, Dolly came up with an idea that would seem utterly ridiculous to most sane-minded people. She suggested to Otto that he quit working for Fred and move into a home, where he could live in the attic. What was even more insane was that Otto agreed. Otto saw positives in this deal. He aspired to become a writer, and this offer would mean that he could have more time to focus on his writing. Not only this, but he could continue his affair with Dolly without prying eyes. Over the next five years, Otto would leave the attic when Fred left for work to spend time with Dolly, and at night time, when Fred was home, he would remain in his secret room in the Osterreich's attic, reading books, writing science fiction, and dabbling in making bathtub gin to pass the time. Dolly would mail Otto's completed stories, with him using a pseudonym to potential publishers, in the hopes of having his books published. While Otto had to remain in complete silence during the hours Fred was around, Fred would notice strange things happening around the home. He would occasionally hear banging from the ceiling, as well as picking up on food and his cigars strangely going missing. However, each time he confronted Dolly with his concerns, she would brush him off, blaming his heavy drinking and saying he was misremembering things. For a while, Fred believed Dolly, but would eventually convince himself that either he was going mad or that his home was haunted. In 1918, Fred presented Dolly with a problem. He had decided that now was the time for the pair to sell their Milwaukee home and move to Los Angeles. After much discussion, Dolly agreed, but she convinced Fred that they could only move into a home that contained an attic. They found a home which overlooked Sunset Boulevard that met Dolly's requirements, and before the married couple moved in, Dolly sent Otto there in advance to ensure that he could get himself set up in the attic prior to their arrival. This went off without a hitch, and Dolly and Otto would continue their unorthodox affair for the next four years. During this time, Fred would continue to notice the same strange patterns, and as a result, he would become more withdrawn and abusive towards Dolly. The arguments the two would have would become more intense, and this would come to a head on the 22nd of August, 1922. That night, Dolly and a likely drunken Fred got into another heated argument. Otto, who had listened to every fight the pair had since moving in, was strictly under instruction not to do anything by Dolly, who said she could handle Fred's outbursts. However, this fight seemed more intense than the previous arguments. Otto, fearing for Dolly's safety, snapped and left the attic and climbed down into the home. He entered Dolly and Fred's bedroom and found Fred's two 25 caliber pistols. He gathered the firearms and made his way towards Fred and Dolly. As he entered the doorway into the living room, Fred felt a presence behind him. Upon turning around, he immediately recognized the man standing there before him, pistols aimed at him. Suddenly it all made sense to Fred, Otto abruptly quitting his job. All the noises he could hear, the food going missing, his cigars disappearing. He wasn't imagining it after all. Fred flew into a rage and lunged at Otto. Otto fired off one shot but it missed. The pair then struggled but Otto was able to fire off another three rounds, two hitting Fred's body and one in the head. Knowing that the commotion would attract attention from the neighbours, Dolly quickly hatched a plan to cover their tracks. She removed Fred's diamond watch and handed this, along with money from her bedroom, to Otto and sent him back into the attic to hide. But before he left, Otto locked Dolly inside a closet 
and threw the keys aside and retreated upstairs. When police arrived, they had no idea that Otto was inside the house and only came across Fred's lifeless body and Dolly locked inside the closet. They immediately began to ask her questions about the events that night, whereby Dolly told them that they had been robbed by unknown perpetrators. They shot Fred and locked her inside the closet before fleeing. As I mentioned, the police were immediately suspicious of Dolly's story. As well as the home being relatively undisturbed, Dolly had stated that she and Fred had never argued throughout their marriage, something which even I can attest is highly unusual. While they believed that Dolly was responsible and that they were sure no robbers locked Dolly inside the closet, they couldn't work out how she could have done this herself. They never considered for a second that they weren't alone in the home at the time. With Fred out of the picture and the police seemingly unable to tie Dolly to his death, she was now free to continue living in her Los Angeles home. Moreover, Otto was now able to leave the attic and live life with Dolly freely and publicly. Or so you would think. Dolly astonishingly convinced Otto to continue their existing arrangement and after moving home again shortly after Fred's murder, he would continue to live inside the attic. Essentially, Otto had become a live-in sex slave of Dolly's. Otto would have some of his stories published and with the little money he made from this, he would purchase a typewriter to continue his works. Incredibly, Dolly would begin seeing other men. She began seeing her estate attorney, Herman Shapiro, who she would gift him with Fred's own diamond watch, the same one that Dolly claimed had been stolen. Shapiro, who was aware of Fred's murder and recognised the watch as being the same, confronted Dolly, who explained that she had been mistaken and that she'd actually found it after the police had left and failed to report it, as she didn't think it was important enough to do so. Another man who would enter Dolly's life would be a businessman named Roy Clum. Dolly may have had ulterior motives with this relationship, however, as she wanted to get rid of Fred's pistols and asked Roy to dispose of one of them. She told Roy that the gun used to kill Fred was similar to his, and that having the gun around was too painful a memory. Roy agreed to her request and threw the gun into the La Brea tar pits. With regards to the other gun, she told the same sob story to a neighbour who agreed to bury the firearm in his backyard. Eventually, Dolly's relationship with Roy Clum would turn sour and she would break things off with him. Whether it was due to his own suspicion of Dolly or otherwise, he went to the local police station to tell them of the gun he disposed of in the La Brea tar pits. Police conducted a search and were able to recover the firearm. However, they were unable to determine whether the gun was the murder weapon, as it had become too corroded. Regardless, on the 12th of July 1923, the same day the gun was found, they arrested Dolly Osterreich of suspicion of murdering her husband Fred. When news of Dolly's arrest hit the headlines, the neighbour immediately told police of the second gun in his backyard and they recovered this also. Again, the gun was too corroded to be confirmed as the murder weapon. Neither Shapiro nor Clum knew of Otto Sanhuber. They probably didn't know of each other. However, for Dolly, she still had to get food and supplies to Otto. With Clum unavailable, she spoke to Shapiro and told him to buy groceries and take them to her house and to tap on the ceiling, where her vagabond half-brother would come down to collect the goods. Shapiro, while surprised by this, agreed and did as he was told. When he visited the home and tapped on the ceiling as instructed, Otto came down, as he would normally do. Otto, however, starved of human interaction for so many years, with the exception of Dolly of course, began to talk openly about his relationship with Dolly and went deep into detail about what they had been up to and what had truly happened to Fred Osterreich. Shapiro, less than impressed, ordered Otto Sanhuber to leave Dolly's home and never to return. Unsurprisingly, Otto put up no resistance and thus ended his decade-long relationship with Dolly Osterreich. 
Herman Shapiro would move in with Dolly shortly after she was placed on bail pending her trial. Unfortunately for her, he remained tight-lipped about what he knew about her. The case against Dolly would eventually be dropped, as police were still unaware of Otto's presence that night, and they still lacked sufficient evidence. As with Klum, things eventually turned sour for both Herman Shapiro and Dolly Osterreich, and in 1930, the pair split. Soon after this, Shapiro went to police and told them everything he knew about Dolly and informed them of Otto Sandhuber. With this new information, police again arrested Dolly Osterreich on a conspiracy charge and tracked down Otto and arrested him too for the murder of Fred Osterreich. Dolly recruited the services of Jerry Giesler, a famed attorney of his time, and was able to secure a hung jury for Dolly, meaning she walked free. Her indictment would eventually be dropped in 1936. For Otto Sandhuber, who was now 43 years old, despite his defence explaining the living conditions he had endured for almost a decade, and that he had effectively been enslaved by Dolly, a jury would still find him guilty of manslaughter. Luckily for Otto, even though he was found guilty, the statute of limitations had expired on Fred Osterreich's case, meaning that he too also walked free. The media would dub this the Batman case, due to him living in a secluded, cave-like attic. This was before the caped crusader graced magazines and movie theatres. Otto would eventually change his name to Walter Klein and move to Canada, where he would marry. Not much else is known about his life other than this. For Dolly Osterreich, she remained in Los Angeles, and she too would remarry a man named Ray Burt Hedrick in 1961, after almost 30 years together. She would die aged 75, just two weeks after her wedding. The things we do for love, eh? I don't know about you, but I can hear the immortal words of the late meatloaf floating around in my head. In all seriousness though, this was an insane case to study. Otto clearly was infatuated with Dolly, and having had no paternal figures in his life, he may have saw Dolly as a maternal figure. Dolly was known to be maternal towards the staff at her husband's textile mill, and as Otto was several years younger than she was, it wouldn't surprise me if she felt some kind of twisted parental attraction to him. But even still, the whole reason for his consensual captivity was to avoid Fred. How he agreed to continue this after his death is utterly beyond me. Maybe it's just the way it was in those days. Who knows? Thank you for watching. If you found this video informative, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel, making sure the notification bell is switched on so you never miss an upload. Until next time, take care and goodbye. For now.